Hello. Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to the Healing Vibrations Network. And I am Gina Dalson, and I'm really excited to be joined here by Cat Finity, all the way from New Zealand, I believe, looking very sunny and tropical there in the background. And Cat is the author of this very inspiring and entertaining book called Never Let a Good Disaster Go to Waste. And I really enjoyed the book and I enjoyed her story and I was inspired by it. And I think it's there's, men, there's many of us in this group that are living with long term illnesses. And there's a lot of us that are multiple sclerosis is the one. And Kat has actually got a bit of a journey with that, which she talks about in the book. And she is now, are you, are you fully symptom free or what's your situation now, Kat? Yeah, so I have been relapsed free for 11 years now and symptom free. I wouldn't say I'm pretty much symptom free. The only thing that I get that's a little bit annoying is leg cramps at night, but that's that's it. And sometimes people will say, oh, you, you walk with a little bit of a limp, but compared to not really being able to walk at all, like I used to and really badly limping, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Excellent. And I'm in Vanuatu. I'm in a country called Vanuatu in the South oh, Pacific. Oh, sorry, I got Vanuatu. I can't even say it. <laughs> Vanuatu, yeah. It's a tiny little country in, in the South Pacific. It's made up of 83 islands. And it's considered the most disaster-prone country in the world. But it's also considered to have the happiest people in the world. Wow. Well, the book doesn't actually tell us how you got there. It tells you uh, it, 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 uh, up to that point before you uh, you actually arrived there. So, so what took you there then? Bearing in mind, you've, you've gone from disasters in here to a disaster prone country. Was that like a, a purposeful thing? or? Well, the way I landed here in paradise is because I literally never let a good disaster go to waste. So my book stems around my, my journey of overcoming MS after about... 15 years of, of disability, having three kids in three years, in my 30s, couldn't really walk much from my, from my 30s and my part of my 40s. I decided to write a book. My husband left me on my 40th birthday. And that's why I decided I'm going to write a book called How to Get Over Betrayal in 12 Hours because people suffer for too long. And, they, and that book is what led me here. So it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll, yeah. I'll tell it to you. So I told everyone for about six years, I'm, I'm writing a book about how to overcome betrayal in 12 hours. And, you know, I thought betrayal is not nearly as bad as having MS and not being able to walk. I, I've got this. And so I, I came up with these 12 principles. And I, in 2018, I went to Bali with the intention of finishing my book. I thought, you know, it's how to get over betrayal in 12 hours. It's only going to take me 12 hours to write it. So I'm going to make a very long story, a bit short. So I was in Bali writing my book and I met, um, I met a woman who said, oh, I love what you're doing. I'd love to help you. I live in Noosa. I'm an editor. I'm like, great. So I went to, to Noosa in Australia and I, I spent some time with her. And while I was with her, she had to go pick up a man who needed a colonoscopy. And I'm like, oh, I'll come with you. I, I was really easily distracted. <laughs> and he said, you know, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm writing a book and this, and Leona is helping me edit it. And he said, well, I'm a publisher. I'd love to help you. And I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. He goes, I live in a country called Vanuatu. Come to Vanuatu and, and I'll, I'll help you publish it. So I said, great. So 2019, I, I got on the plane and uh, to fly to Vanuatu. And on my way here, I was coming for two weeks. And on my way, I, I read an article in the, the On Flight magazine about this incredible journey to the, the middle of Santo through this jungle and this gorge. I'm like, I want to do this big hike to say, like, I did it. I can walk again, you know. Yeah. So I took down the author's name and I got to Vanuatu to, to publish my book. And I called up the author of this article in the, in the magazine. And, and then I met him and he was a writer and we fell in love. And so... Um, my two week trip here, COVID hit. So two weeks, I got stranded on an island for two and a half years in paradise. Oh, we didn't have COVID. You. I never wore a mask 
Oh, wow. I know. And he happened to be a journalist. So he started reading the book I, I was about to publish. He said, oh, let's change this. Let's change that. And two and a half years of full time, another two and a half years. So, yes, that's how I got to Vanuatu. Very long story. Wow. But yes, I came for two weeks and, and now it's home. Wow. So are your kids out for with me. you or? So actually, I'm very excited. My daughter's coming today, but I didn't see my kids for two and a half years. My oh youngest my daughter was just finishing grade 12 when I left and my two boys were in university. And a lot of people say to me, didn't you miss your kids? I'm like, well, if I thought about it, yes, I did. But I believe in wherever you are is where you're meant to be. And you have a choice always. And I could choose to be really sad or I could choose to think my heart lights up every time I think of my kids. And my kids were fine. They were happy. They're like, mom, you're in paradise. Like, don't come back to Australia right now. <laughs> and it, it was um, it was great. And I really believe we, we always have control. We don't always have control of the situation that we're in, but we always have control of our reaction to it. So there's always a way to change your perception, which is what I, I, I literally wrote a book called Never Let a Good Disaster Go to Waste. Ended up in the most disaster prone country in the world in the middle of a massive disaster. <laughs> and I'm a I, would, I would say you couldn't write it could you but yeah you could write it you could write it <laughs> I, that's, right. I, that's right I really I really love what you, you say about being happy because the, um interestingly it came up in a conversation with somebody else um today around the whole idea of of, of being happy you know when we think about what we want in life there might be things that we want or maybe experiences that we want to do but most of us have this idea that we want to be happy but then actually what does happy look like what does happy feel like and I think happiness is a choice isn't it like you said you, you could quite easily have got down in the dumps and and ruined your whole two and a half years in paradise you know worrying about your you're worrying about your children who weren't with you who haven't yeah, enjoying their life well maybe not quite enjoying it quite as much as you <laughs> with all the confines that we had during that time but uh but yeah I, um tell us more about your perception of happiness and and how you yeah ha how happiness has evolved for you really first of all I think yes well happiness is a choice however I think always striving for happiness keeps us unhappy. So I really talk more about contentment. And it's funny, you know, I live here in paradise. Like it's literally paradise. And so many people here are suffering, especially during COVID. It's like you, you take your suffering with you. There's still suffering when you have palm trees and pina coladas. People think, oh, if I just move to an island and have your life. It's like, no, lots of people here are suffering. But the thing is, is that you can't have you can't have happiness without sadness. You can't have ecstasy without agony. You know, you can't have health without sickness. But it's overly attaching to those times of pain and thinking that they're going to last that causes this idea of a depression. I always say this too shall pass. And the times when I'm in my, because it's not that I don't hit dark times and tough times because I do. I'm not superhuman. But the length of time I choose to suffer is a choice. And I always say you can suffer for 12 hours, 12 days, 12 years, or a lifetime. But suffering is a choice. And whenever that happens to me, I choose 12 hours. And when I get down in those dark times and when I hit rock bottom, I'm like, yes, because those are the impetus. That, that's the thing that's going to help me change who I am and what I'm doing. It's like something's not going right change it and I am the only one nobody else is coming like Mel Robbins says nobody's coming no one's coming to pull me out of those dark days it's only up to me so I have to realize that those experiences are happening for a reason and I'm not the first person to go through this I think a lot of times people suffer because they feel like I'm the only one going through all this it's like you're not the only one everyone goes through this you know, you have a choice, though, to, to stay down or to pull yourself back up. 
And probably my number one reason for pulling myself back up each time I get down, because I've had many down times, I was suicidal for a time. You know, like I said, it was I couldn't really walk for nearly 12 years with MS. And, and but my biggest reason for overcoming it is because if I don't overcome my pain, who else is going to wear my pain? If I don't overcome my sadness, my depression, my melancholy, who am I spreading that to? And especially after COVID, I believe that we now realize that everything that we do affects someone else. I breathe on you and I'm not well, I affect you. If I don't overcome my pain, I transfer my pain to you. So who is suffering because you don't overcome suffering? And that's what I, a question I always ask myself. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's so right. And it is challenging for everybody like you say no, no nobody gets through life without having challenged in with pain and with sadness and with the highs and lows of life and and sometimes I think it, from my own point of view as well like social media definitely doesn't help because you look at the social media and, and everyone seems to be having a marvelous time don't they everyone just seems to be happy because that's the the, the what you portray and it's yeah it, I don't know what, what I wanted to say really but it was it was just more around recognizing that we do we do have a choice and I know that you've you've got what I really liked about this book is that you on every chapter you've got a little bit of word of wisdom you've got a nice little quote and uh, and and it was I, I read it in in May so it was May no it was, it was when I was on holidays so it was August August time and uh, so I was just having a flick through last night to to you know, just to remind myself of what it is and actually I was I I took myself to the page where you talk about um, uh, I don't know if you can see it on here about your uh I don't have my glasses on I no. be happy so think less feel more frown less smile more talk less listen more judge less accept more complain less appreciate more watch less do more fear less love more and then you've got peace of mind p-o-m and those it's just I, I, that was it you had um you'd come away from your um uh you'd been off on for this retreat yeah to to your trip and then come mm -hmm. come away with these um somebody had embroidered them on a on a tea towel all, all these words never let a good disaster go to waste your buddhist trip that was it so she, you, you're buddhist so 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 tell me a bit more about how buddhism has um sort of helped on your journey Buddhism completely changed my life. I was suicidal in my mid thirties. I'd had or early thirties. I'd had three kids in three years. I had been diagnosed with MS um, when I was twenty four. I I was told I could have MS and was diagnosed, confirmed when my first son was um, three weeks old, and told not to have any more kids. And I ended up having three children in three years by accident. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I'm an idiot. And, and I did, I went downhill and I hit, I hit rock bottom hard. You know, I, I, I needed to use my stroller as a walking frame. Like I, I, I really struggled to walk for very far distances. And I lived in the middle of nowhere and I was suicidal. And I thought I wanted to drive to drive into a tree and I would never commit suicide. Like, so my kids would know I'd always, you know, want to make it look like an accident. And I thought, I can't live like this anymore. I was so upset and depressed. And I thought I either have to end my life or I need to find an answer for my, my depression and my sadness and my hating of where my life was. I was a fitness instructor and I couldn't barely walk anymore. And everything I loved about life was as you know it felt like it was being torn away from me mm -hmm. and I thought I have to leave my children and move to India and and learn Buddhism 
but thankfully I found a class in Melbourne <laughs> and I used to drive. I lived in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere in Australia. It's a flat, boring town. It's, it's, it was, there's 800 people there. It was, yeah. And that was also a, a, a source of um, tension for me as well, living in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, I, when I found Buddhism, the first class changed my life. And this is why the teacher said to me, if you want to change your life, you need to realize that nothing exists except for your perception of it. It's your idea that everything sucks. And she said, you need to find something that you hate and turn it into something you love. And you've got one week to do it. And I'm like, okay, I hated Vegemite. So she said, start with something small and something tangible and easy. So my thing was Vegemite, which is like Marmite, I guess, in, yeah, um, yeah. in England. And I hated Vegemite. So that week I, I, I kept talking to people. I said, how do you love Vegemite? They're like, oh, it's great. You know, you make toast, you put lots of butter and just a little bit of Vegemite on top. I'm like, a little bit. You don't like it either, obviously. <laughs> but anyway, so that week I spent trying to love Vegemite. And I got to the point where I could eat it and not like, go, oh, it's awful. And that's when I realized if I can change my perception on something I hated so fundamentally, I could change my perception on everything in my life and I realized at that moment that my perception my reality was my perception and to to change it so I flipped you know I, I had a trouble walking but I was like but I can still walk I live in the middle of nowhere but you know I've got three children you know three young kids I've got kids I'm so lucky I've got a husband that I used you know that I, I found always found fault with but I thought I could choose to see all the good in him all the good things that he's doing I'm choosing to see all the bad you know I was at Melbourne I had to drive four hours to my Buddhist class but I've got a car you know I've got a house I could choose to see all the things that were going right but I was put in at the time I was just seeing everything that was going wrong I was focused on everything going wrong and so Vegemite and Buddhism really changed my life when I realized I could change my perception but probably one of the most, and, and there are so many takeaways and I, I still study all the time today, but one of the most important things I find is that all of our happiness comes from our desire to bring happiness to others. And all of our suffering stems from our obsession with self. And I was, I was obsessed with myself and my suffering and all day for me, for me, all the things that weren't going right. And I never once thought, imagine these poor kids having a mother that was so upset all the time and cranky and, and angry. And my husband, who's got a wife who's, you know, stuck in this hole. I wasn't thinking about others. And when I started to think about others more and stop worrying about myself all the time, my life fundamentally changed. And I keep, to, and that's why part of my book is I have a project here where I am. Um, I'm helping people have protein. I have a chicken project because people here don't have enough protein. The baby's brains don't develop. So I know the times I'm down, I need to dive into helping others. And it's not because I'm such a kind person. I do it for me. <laughs> it's called selfish enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> selfish enlightenment. I like that. I like that. But but it's but it's so true, isn't it? I think it's that's why um volunteering is such powerful thing to do if you're not feeling in a in a good place because you you for one you realize actually what you what you have exactly that that we all I mean even the fact that we're talking now you know we've got a lot haven't we the fact that we're, we're so talking in a safe place and we've got enough to be able to communicate across miles and miles and miles and and share our stories is we're incredibly lucky absolutely when you think of some challenges that people go through and and the truth is nobody goes through life without any challenges they really don't and it's and and even when we we've got over some there will be more to, there, there's, there will always be more because that's I don't know what what life really is but maybe it's just overcome growth isn't it it's a growth centric way and the only way we're going to grow my book is called <laughs> Is by my book's called Never Let. Challenges. That's sorry. right. And my book's Making Sense. Sorry, no, I didn't yeah. interrupt it. But my book is called Making Sense of a Life of Absurdity yes. because it's absurd. We suffer because of just the fact that we're alive, the fact that we have problems, 
the problem is thinking that having a problem is a problem. And then we, we complain about it and we suffer because of, of life. It's like, why are you suffering? If, if, if you don't have a problem, it's because you haven't got a heartbeat probably. So yeah. it's yeah. like, how can I never let a good disaster go to waste? And how can I transform every single opportunity into, oh, sorry, obstacle um, into Every problem into, into an opportunity because every problem is an mm -hmm. opportunity, isn't it? It's an opportunity to learn, to grow, to discover more about our, ourselves. I certainly, that's what I found this, um, the, the healing journey that I'm, I'm on with MS is, is, encouraging I won't say forcing encouraging me to to look inwards for answers and discover what you know what it is that makes me happy and uh, that nece that isn't necessarily doing a certain thing or being in a certain place it is how how I speak to myself and how I you know acknowledge what's going on around me that there's the, the challenges that we face yeah, if we can get, if we were able to get to a place where we're actually, yay, another challenge. It's, um, yeah. And the Stoics did that. The Stoics actually would go out and they would look for opportunity. If, if life was getting too easy for the Stoics, they would go out and look for a challenge because they knew that it's something that we have need to practice. We need to practice hitting those challenges. It's like when you work out, right? I, I teach fitness and I love it when it gets hard and challenging because that's where the growth happens. There's no growth without, without, without stress, without, without yes. stretching. But in my book, it's sorry. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, like, I've got the 12 principles to never let a good disaster go to waste. Mm -hmm. because yes, that was it's really hard. It's yeah. really hard sometimes to go, you know, how can this be a good thing? You know, I lost, this, you know, God forbid the worst of the worst, you know, you lose someone that you love. I talk in my book about um, when I lost my mother on my 12th birthday, I was the eldest of five children and we were three, five, six, eight, ten, twelve. Oh. And yes, that's tragic when you lose someone, but it is life. And there's a great fable in Buddhism where Buddha said, this woman lost her baby and she said to Buddha, Buddha, my, my only baby's died. Can you please help me? She, he said, yes, I'd love to help you. If you can go find me a mustard seed from a household who has known no suffering from loss. And it's just a fact of life that we'll all lose someone. And the most profound thing, and, that, and that's how I, I came to write my book, because on the night of my betrayal, I, I thought back to all of the hardest times in my life. And one of them was obviously my mother's death. And what my father said to me was, your mother would, you know, she chose to live until your birthday. She had cancer and she was in a coma and she swore she was going to live to her firstborn's birthday. And he said it was a, her, her death was a gift for you to show you the strength that we actually have inside. And he said, I know your mother would choose what your mother would want you to do in your life. And it wouldn't be to wallow and grieve. It would be to overcome it and be stronger because of it. Yeah. And, and that was profound, you know? So I, I've always, and so many things that happened on my birthday, I had a stem cell transplant on my birthday. My husband left me on my birthday. You know, my mother died on my birthday. And people say, oh, you know, all these things happened to you on your birthday. I'm like, yeah, I'm so fortunate. You know, I, what a blessing these all are, really that's uh yeah that's, i choose to see it that way that's so amazing and you you mentioned there about um the stem cell treatment that you had so was that um was that is that enabled you then to be free of um a lot of the ms symptoms now what what do you what what, what would you say would was the sort of um i don't know if there is one thing i don't think there is one thing there's probably it's probably a collection of of different things that actually got you to where you are with regard to your health but it'll be interesting to know what you yeah. think yes well look if anyone that has ms I've, i pretty much did almost everything that you could possibly do to try to cure myself um and so one of them was 15 years ago i a friend of mine was one of the well she happened to be my neighbor and the the, the abc in canada followed her on this journey she had 
primary progressive MS. She was a golf pro. She was a well-known golf, golf pro. And her neurologist in, in Canada sent, said, you know, maybe try Israel. There's a guy in Israel who's doing stem cell. So she went to Israel and she had great results. So that's when I decided to do stem cell as well. And this is a different, it's not the HSCT that people are doing. It was a different type of cell, stem cell. They took the bone marrow from my hip and they grew it to certain parts per million. Then I went to Athens and they re-injected it into my spine. And, and yes, that nearly killed me. I had a brain hemorrhage for four days. But oh my goodness. I walked out of that hospital not being able to bend anymore and, and in a lot of pain. But then I realized I could walk again. My left leg hadn't lifted for over maybe seven years at that point. I couldn't lift my left leg at all. And even though I, I was really in a lot of pain, I, when I left, I realized I could walk again. Sorry, this puppy's just come up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that really changed things for me. I, I started walking again and then I started running again. Wow. And interestingly enough, I, I went to my neurologist because I'd, I'd seen this neurologist and he was like, ah, oh, you're wasting your money. It was like $40,000, which happened to all be fundraised for me behind my back by this community in Australia and my family oh, in wow. Canada. And um, the neurologist, when I went back, you know, I was like, he said to me, oh, it's not going to work. And then I went back and I'm like, oh, look at me walking heel to toe. Look at me, you know, lifting my leg. And you know, I was like so excited to show him. Like, I'm like, do you know what this means? This is like a cure for your, your patients that can't walk. Like, I was so excited. And he just sat there shaking his head. And he said, oh, you're worse. When are you going to go back on your DMTs? I'm like, what? I'm worse? I'm like, but I'm running again. Like, I know I'm not worse. Like, I'm, I'm walking. Like, I'm, I'm not having to step and, like, throw my leg. I don't have to lift my leg in and out of the car. I said, how, how, do, you, how do you figure I'm worse? He said, oh. When I ask you to lift your leg, you're not as strong. I said, I couldn't lift it at all before. And that's when I really realized, you know, people's perceptions, their reality, when they believe that's not going to work, you know, the proof is right there. And, but it was interesting. After that day, he put such a doubt in my mind, I couldn't run anymore. But I did, I could walk. And for five years, all those symptoms, I, I, I was on a strict diet up to that point. I was like, after a few years, I was really well, so I dropped the diet, and I was really good. Five years after the stem cell, I did have another relapse, but the stem cell certainly did bring back my ability to walk. Yeah. Absolutely, and it gave me it bought me five years of of yeah. no disease activity at all. That's amazing. So, uh, I, I think it's. Um, I mean, I know from my own journey, and I'm, and I'm sure other people will find the same that there's no there's no one route is there for anybody finding you know, finding wellness, finding healing. It's um, it's about I think taking the opportunities when they present themselves if they feel right to you. So how do I mean that must have been quite a scary decision to make to go and to go to a foreign country and to have a sort of pioneering treatment. So what, what was your sort of mindset around around that? What 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 made you say yes to that? There's a few things in my life. I love to feel the fear and do it anyway. I've always been a pioneer. I've always like, what can I do? Like you're telling me you're going to give me, and this is, I was diagnosed, you know, 26 years ago. And the only drugs I had was uh, beta, beta interferon and capaxin. Mm -hmm. And I think there was one other. And they're like, oh, you know, this will re reduce your relapse rate by 30%. I'm like, well, that doesn't, that's not great, really. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm going to cure myself. And I was really on a, a journey to cure myself. And I was like, whatever it takes. Because my biggest fear wasn't death. My biggest fear was not being able to really live. And I was like, I will do anything that it takes. Um, so and it's funny. I've always been someone that likes to, to live on the edge. I love challenging my comfort zones. I love being fearless. And the whole COVID stay safe thing. And I'm like, no, don't stay safe. Go no, and live. No, no. Go and, and push the <laughs> limits. You know, what are you scared of? Like, really, what are you scared of? We didn't, you haven't lost all sense of self-preservation. I'm sure you can, you can drive home without dying. <laughs> so without someone telling you to, to stay safe, it's like, no, go out there and live on the edge. Take risks. That's where the, the sweetest fruit is at the end of the limbs. Like, go for it. What have you got to lose? 
no I, and that I, was my thing what have you got yeah. to lose what have you got to lose and and the doctors in Israel they'd say oh the only thing you have to lose is money you know <laughs> which I did but I didn't wouldn't say I lose it it was an amazing investment you know I was yeah I got my I got my walk back I mean what did, what, what is that worth yeah yeah and that's never got it's never gone back again you, you're you're still walking and uh running and yeah, I am um, now fifty-one. Um, I've been doing triathlons. I I can run wow. five kilometers. Where before, before I used to travel. You know, I used to travel a lot overseas. And I, if I went to Bali or Thailand, I was petrified. I was like, "How am I going to cross the road? I can barely walk." And if I had to hurry, it's like I'll fall flat on my face. Like I was really yeah. worried because I just I couldn't even walk that that short distance even fast because it was no, like such a, definitely makes effort, you feel vulnerable that's you know? for sure because that's that that's the, the situation exactly I'm at the moment. yeah yeah definitely yeah it does it does and I remember I was going to Italy for a trip and it was with a group I, I used to be a thermomix consultant and I thought oh I've got to um they'll probably be walking a lot and I'm like how am I going to walk how am I going to keep up with the group so I started making myself walk more and we had a lake and as I walked around the lake with some friends and I was struggled and I hung on to them and they were doing another lap and I was really struggling. I thought this is embarrassing. I thought, no, go do another lap. And I was tripping, but I was like, but you did it, but I did it. So I just kept, I'd keep pushing myself, keep pushing myself, keep finding my limits. And I think that's really important. The second you sit down and say, I can't do that anymore, you won't be able to do it anymore. So you need the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. You've got to step and then you've got to step and then you've got to step. But so many times we'll go, oh, but it's too hard. Yeah. You know, it's too well, difficult. Well, this is I it. can't it, do it. It, it. It's it's easy to get into that place. Interesting you say that because I've um, upped my walking game. I've got a little, um, a little pond near where I live and I, I've got a dog and I can, and it's only a, half a kilometer from my house round the little pond and back to my house again but there were getting times and if I'm doing something else sometimes I'll go swimming say or if I'm going shopping then to do that walk and then go and do something else is a, is a little bit much so I've got a little mobility scooter so I take the mobility scooter to the edge of the pond walk around the pond and then get on the scooter again and I was getting into a habit of doing that so therefore shrinking my walk but now I've just over the last couple of weeks, I'm like, no, let's get back out and consciously just remind you. myself how to walk, you know, lifting the leg. And, and what it is, walking is such a thing that most of us take for granted. You don't think about how oh, you walk. I know. <laughs> and, but now I'm sort of thinking about every little step. OK, I've got to lift my leg up. I've got to bend it back. I've got to stand. And all the time you've got to stand on one foot while you're lifting the other leg, which when your balance is off is not easy either. So even the, yeah, the, yeah. the act of walking takes real conscious thought and effort. Um, but I've also been learning more about how our, how our neural pathways can, can rewire and actually if even even if you're not able to get out and do that if you imagine yourself doing that lifting your leg putting your heel down and and moving forward then the imagination can get your neural pathways going so if, if you're not physically going outside spend some time imagining that you're actually walking and what that feels like and I spent and, many years so this leg wouldn't work and I've spent many years just lifting it and, and and trying to lift it you know and I'm thinking even if I could lift it one inch I was like yes and then it got better and better and better and it is it's so true you can create new neural pathways it's like you can't do that I always say it's not you can't do it so you can't I can't do it yet I will get yes. there I can't do it yet yes. it's like what are, what are you trying your brain will want to succeed you have to keep trying and keep going maybe you can't do it the way you you think you can but find another way fine it's like water it's like find another way yeah. but if you sit and do nothing you absolutely will not find another way you, you'll be stuck there forever yes. and, and nobody's will, coming no be, one's coming to force you that will be your reality I think that you know when you said that about the your, your doctor saying you know almost putting the doubt in you, even though you could see the evidence it was getting better he then said no it wasn't and you're almost in this battle of and I, and this is the the challenge we have with our medical profession 
because our medical, you know, I was told when I was diagnosed that, you know, that there is no cure, which we know isn't true. Um, that's, you know, it's likely to get worse, which isn't also true for everybody. And then when I asked, was there anything I could do about it? They said, no, you just got to wait for the scientist to find a cure. It's like, well, that could take a lifetime plus, couldn't it? So, so that whole, what we're told is not empowering and does not help us move. So we, we we have to let go of those. Well, I've let go of those beliefs. I talk about them a lot because they, they were so in my head and I and I just took them as truth because the, the woman in the white coat told me so, who'd been to you know university and knew a lot about bodies and the brain, but they don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. Well, I talk, in, there's a chapter in my book called Ignorant Bliss. And it's because when I first was diagnosed, I was told, you know, don't have any more children and you should probably be able to walk at least until you're 40. And I called the MS Society. My first time I called them, I was diagnosed. And it said, MS is a progressively debilitating disease that strikes young people down in the prime of their lives. And I hung up and I thought, well, I'm not listening to that because this is the, the narrative. So, so many people will say to me, yeah, well, you know, I've got all these lesions, I've got all these problems. And there's actually studies done when they give results to people. So they had two people with bad back and they gave, gave the results to one people and said, pe- set of people. And they said, yeah, these are your results for your back. The other people, they didn't give the results. The people that had the result and the story were much worse. Um, I don't know, this is probably about it, but I, I know lots of children, you know, having three kids, a lot of kids got diagnosed with Asperger's and like, it was like overnight, they got worse. It's like once you, you, you attach you a, label a label or a story on it, to something, uh, you become uh, worse. So I talk about ignorant bliss and some people go, you know, read right in the MS and all the things that could happen. It's like, you know, and, and when I did a drug called Lemtrada, people are scared of doing the drugs. They're like, did you read the side effects? I'm like, God, no. <laughs> no, if, if I've decided to do this, I don't need to know the side effects. When it happens, I'll know. And yes, yeah. when I was bleeding out of my nose and my eyes and my gums, oh my I knew goodness. I had ITP. When I couldn't get off, you know, when I nearly fell asleep driving and, and, and could barely move and fell into a coma. Yeah, I knew I had a thyroid problem, <laughs> you know. I knew it then. I didn't need to worry about it for years up to it. I knew that it was happening. So I think ignorant bliss in the sense that you don't need to know everything that could happen, have enough knowledge for sure to do everything that you can to combat it, which is basically diet, exercise. And yeah, there's there's probably a few drugs, but I don't think we need to be focusing on outcomes that potentially could never happen. Why let your brain go there? But the no, point in, in fact, it's, it can achieve if you believe. I think it would be much more helpful to focus on the, I, I talk a lot about intention, setting the intention. So when whenever you go down whatever route you choose to go on your healing journey or the next leg of your healing journey, whether that's a, a different diet or a different medication or a different exercise or modality or whatever it is, go with the intention that actually this is going to help you move forward. It might not be the the absolute cure but who knows it might be it might be the thing that actually gets you out of you know allows you to lift that foot up and allows you to walk without aid so and and just trust that actually it is possible it is possible and read about more more stories like cats and more stories like there's plenty of plenty of people out there that are living symptom free or a lot less symptoms now because they've they've challenged their that belief that it's not possible and uh, yeah, my that, website think, Kat yeah Parity, i was just gonna say yeah, I saw on my I, website, i've got lots of I've got lots of blogs on there um i talk about what i did to heal myself uh and a lot of people say you know there there is no cure but i always say success leaves clues and i always say you know nothing's impossible if somebody actually does it they used to believe the four mi- minute mile was impossible until somebody did it and that's you know the, the, the reason I originally wrote my book was because I overcame my husband's betrayal in 12 hours when I had these 12 epiphanies and people say, how do you, you can't get over betrayal in 12 hours? I'm like, yeah, until somebody does it. And then you're like, oh yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you know, sure talking can. like we are right now with something that, you know, 30 years ago, people go, like, well, you can't do that. You can't, you know, 
have a camera that's not plugged in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it, was, it was impossible miles. until no. it's not. It, you know, like and now it's just the it's norm, isn't it? Impossible until you do them. Yeah, yeah. So I really believe whatever you want your body and your your life to look at. What are you doing right now? Like yeah. people go, oh, I'll start next year, or I'll start next week, or I'll start tomorrow. I'm like, no, you start now, because all you ever have is now. Everything is happening now. What what your what your thoughts are now creates chemicals in your body that will determine who you are in the next moment, and the next moment, and the next moment. So right now is the only power we ever have to take that choice to make a difference for your tomorrows. But so often we're like, ah, I can't be bothered. Oh, you know, I I. I hear a lot. Oh, my body's telling me to rest. I'm like, your body's not telling you to rest. You gotta watch the brain. Yeah, you gotta always your ask mind yourself is telling, to live. telling you to rest and watch Netflix. Your body would never. And tell it's you not. To watch I always say, if you want to always live to your higher purpose, always ask yourself, what my what would my future self want me to do right now? Hmm. What would my future would my future self say? Yeah, sit down and and watch that last last episode of. Uh, house or whatever yeah. you're watching and say no get up go for a walk move I want my body to be strong for tomorrow so always ask yourself you know when you're going to eat something what would my future self want right now would my future self want me to eat this or eat that because the body keeps score you know your body knows when you're eating cake or when you're eating an apple yeah we yeah, always have a choice we have a choice every moment that's so true that's so true well Thank you so much. We've sort of come to the end of um, nearly an hour together. This has uh, been amazing to talk to you. So your your website is catfinity, catfinity.com, isn't it? Um, and I would definitely recommend anybody go and have a look because you've got some real words of wisdom in there about all the sorts of things that we've been talking about. And of course, this book, if you want a good Christmas present this year, I suggest buying this because... Not only has it, it does it tell Kat's story in, in in more detail, but it's it's just an easy read. And I like a book that's an easy read. What I really like about it at the end of every chapter, you're you 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 almost can't put it down. It, it's like a series of Netflix in your hand. So um, yeah, I really I really enjoyed your story. And it's certainly not a story about MS. I mean, yes, I do talk about MS in it, but it's really much a story about overcoming suffering from a betrayal and but it's funny I, I try to keep it lighthearted because I believe no situation could be uh, every situation can benefit from brevity and from laughter and to see the brighter side so it's constantly learning how to never let a good disaster go to waste because at the end of the day my happiness is no one else's responsibility and my suffering is no one else's fault we're always we're always either in a disaster or between two of them but we always have a choice how we react to them yeah and that's and, and i suppose that is the uh the 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 way to a happy life isn't it that 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 mindset and that way of way of thinking that recognizing that whatever happens in our lives is happening for a reason i know it's a bit of a happening you know, for me yeah, it is. If, if it's happening for me, then then what is it? What is it here to, to give me? Um, I mean, mm. I, I talk a lot on when when I do podcasts and stuff about illness being a gift, because when you're you're diagnosed with something, you know, lifelong as uh, as M M S M S is meant to be, then that's a, that's a scary place to be. And like we've already said, it, it can floor you. It can stop you even doing anything that's it I've got this label wanting to live mm -hmm. yeah I can't do anything but actually mm -hmm. actually it doesn't mean that at all it just means that you find a different a different way of doing things and the way that we've done things up to now maybe is not is, well it's certainly not the way that we need to do them going forward so things are changing and we don't tend to like change very much as human beings so it's embracing that that okay another change another change and really enjoying it yeah absolutely I think you know they say in life we need certainty but we also need uncertainty but whatever we think we always have a choice to be content or to be unhappy so yeah. happiness is a choice at the end of the day yeah I think and, so spread love so, be happy and who else can help 
yeah I think I think sometimes as well it's just like well how, how could, what what thought would make me feel better you know what's a better feeling thought yeah. than what I'm feeling right now maybe if you're feeling oh I haven't got any money or the bank bank is really low because that tends to be tends to be one that's on on my books quite often but actually then it's refocusing yeah well I've got a I've got a roof over my yeah. head I've got food on the table yeah what more do I actually need I'm able to speak to wonderful people like you across thousands and thousands of miles and uh and I yeah, live in a country it. here you know and most people here have no running water like my neighbors like that and shit like that that house is I don't know if you can see it just next well it's not wow. even a house it's, wow. it's just like a shack you know they they go and collect water every day they have no power they have no electricity the kids don't go to school you know um people here but they're all they're content I'm not saying it's it's, it's great but you know we have so much abundance in the west yes. we won the lottery the life lottery we won in the west we have enough money we have enough education yeah. we have enough of everything you know yeah. and okay. it's going what problems am i grateful for not having even medical care here you have cancer they give you they give you a tylenol a panadol they don't have treatments they don't have mri scans or or treatments for anything there's no health care here so even that in itself if you're not well be grateful that you have a doctor that can actually do a test and maybe give you some medicine because yeah. it does not exist for most of the world. You even won the lottery, but we don't realize that often because no, we're stuck we're... in our suffering. So what problems? Yeah. And I run retreats here. If anybody wants to come, come on over. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it looks it looks amazing. Yeah, I'll definitely, um, yeah, definitely let me know about your next one because that looks um incredible place to go and uh, hang out for a little bit and feel a little bit more content and happy about life but uh right Kat. You're very welcome yes and uh, thank so, you gina thank you so much That's i Kat's love what finity. you do i love what you yeah. do thank you darling thank you okay we'll say goodbye now let me just say goodbye to facebook bye, -bye facebook goodbye facebook <laughs> stop recording <laughs>